Thank you very much. Thank you for the remarks, David, uh, Richard, rather. Um, and would just wanted to express gratitude to Eight Data and to our other sponsors for pulling us all together here. I think we've played a hosting role, but a lot of the heavy lifting was done by our colleagues here. And I also want to recognize, as John Louis did, that our colleagues from DEC that have been part of Open Data at the bank have been sort of trailblazers for us. Um, I want to try to pick up where Richard left off uh, in terms of um, opening up aid information, opening up the World Bank information as being a very important step, but certainly not sufficient. Um, you know, in as much as I think we still have a long way to go at the bank um, in terms of more and more things we can open, more and more ways we can be open, there's a lot of rich content we have, there's micro data, there's subnational data. We're trying to add to this sort of repository treasure trove of data. But I'm going to be bold and say that the um, marginal value that we can continue to add uh, by continuing to open up this institution is small. Um, we can do more, and there's more we should do. But I think the area where we can be much, much more powerful is by helping our clients open up. The many, many countries that we work with and service, uh, lend to, give advice to, are now increasingly, and I have a list of, I think, eight and growing rapidly, have said, can you help us do open data? And I think that the power and the possibility there, with all due humility, is much greater than just opening up our own institution. And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit today, that from opening the bank to supporting open government, which is very much aligned with the OGP initiative that Richard talked about, which is very much incrementally building on our own open initiative by launching, hopefully in Busan, something called Open Aid, which is inviting a number of other donors now to join us, and we're going to be doing this with Aid Data and others, um, and extend our sort of geocoding work beyond the bank, beyond district level to project level, and ultimately um, listening to the sort of beneficiaries of the projects. So, you know, I'll start by saying that there is a new vision here. Some of you have heard President Zelik talk about it at the Peterson Institute um, last year at Georgetown University, where he really talks about doing development differently, uh, about a new social contract um, is one phrase which often comes to mind. When we look at Egypt, when we look at Tunisia, we say, look, you know, this was a model that was really based on a state that was that had an established social contract. It was largely about subsidized food, jobs, in return for a certain degree of um, acquiescence. Um, and that contract is not even being honored, in a sense, by the countries themselves. They're not able to provide jobs and cheap food for people. And so young people have said, "Where's you know? why should we hold up our end of the contract when you're not holding up yours? And I think that type of accountability, which is clearly not about donor accountability, which is not about externalized accountability, is about accountability with the state. And I think we have um, some way to go to helping those countries create pathways to become more accountable to their citizenry. Um, and I think that's where I, I want the future of our open work to go. Um, you know, more than a year ago, we opened up our data, and I was just telling David Wheeler and others a few moments ago that when that happened, people were surprised um, that we generated more traffic to our data catalog than we do to our homepage. Um, it didn't surprise some of us because we said our users and our clients are not the same people. The majority of people that come to the World Bank don't come for loans. They come for information. They come for insight. They come for knowledge. Um, and when we opened up a lot of the information that we used to hold, uh, a lot of people came. And there's a difference, as this crowd certainly knows, between what's public and what's searchable, what's usable, what's easy to find and reuse. And we changed uh, the model from being public to being searchable, machine-readable, reusable, and easy to find by search engine. So now when you search external debt Tanzania on Google or any other search engine, you particularly with Google now, you get very quickly the trend line, the answer, and the source in one response, and then you click on Tanzania or on the box, and you can then compare that to any other country in the world. 
And what I thought was very powerful is within sort of almost weeks of us launching open data, very quickly, um, Michael Benedict and others from Blind Data told us where our data was not as good, uh, which I think was a great service. They told us where we can improve. And I think it's that kind of opportunity not to see this as criticism, but as an invitation to do better and to work with others, which is how we're going to keep um, opening and sort of being more robust. Um, when we invited the world through Apps for Development um, to take our data and see what they can do with it, and we're now about to do this with our climate data. In Durban, we are hoping to launch an apps competition around climate data. People did things with our data that we never imagined that they would do. My sort of my favorite example, which was not even one of the winning entries, but was the entry where people took our weather data, climate data, and created a very simple app where you can put in any address in the world and it shows you almost immediately where that address is on a background map in Google or Bing and will tell you, uh, based on a polygon you can draw with your, mo- uh, with your mouse, exactly how much rainfall you can expect next year based on historical data and what crops you can grow. Now, the World Bank would have never c- c- created that app, and we shouldn't because that's not what we do. But if we are open about what we do, and we curate and normalize and release the information, other people can do very powerful things with it. And then our work around mapping, some of you know, some of you know this, but just want to show it very quickly, is that we went from these very sort of thick documents called pads at the World Bank to country level. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you now get a sense of what's the relationship between where we work and poverty in Tanzania, which is a map that we didn't have before. And ultimately, where we want to get to is the idea of not only mapping at the country level, at the sector level, but ultimately what some of my friends and I call Yelp for development, which is why is it that you can rate a restaurant or um, you know, a sports complex, but not a health clinic, a water point, or um, a pharmacy. And so that's where we're now building upon prototypes. But I want to go back to the point of intermediaries. Um, and this idea that um, putting out the data is enough is insufficient. Um, but I like to say that I think we learned in this country through the Carnegies that sometimes you got to build the libraries while you build literacy. And sometimes you got to build the libraries before you build literacy. And so I think the various open data initiatives are necessary and important and powerful, but insufficient. And they're insufficient because unless you have people that go to libraries and know what to do with them, libraries are not enough. And so some of you have heard me use the metaphor of the fuel, the vehicles, and the drivers, right? And what we've done so far, for example, at the bank, is we've released a lot of fuel. And sometimes it's rocket fuel. It's really good fuel. And the extent to which it's national or subnational, it's turbocharged fuel, because it really matters to people. But fuel on its own doesn't do anything. You've got to have vehicles to put the fuel in. And the vehicles are, are the tools, the applications, the different pieces of analysis that can use fuel. But even if you have a vehicle and you have fuel in it, where does the vehicle go without drivers, right? And that's the role of the intermediary. In some instances, there will be countries and there will be societies where citizens themselves will take the data, understand it, interpret it, and do something with it. There's Brookings institutions in other countries, there's universities, there's media, etc. But what I'm more interested in are the representatives of people and the civil society institutions that can then take that information, make sense of it, and help give it context, advocacy purposes, share it with people in ways that are appropriate. It may be through radio, it may be through maps, it may be through all kinds of very local ways that may not be considered high tech, but this is not about high tech. This is about giving people access to information, the right information at the right time that really matters for their lives. But in this metaphor, I've never talked about the roads. Who builds the roads? Well, the roads, I think, well, certainly the rules of the roads are things like IATI, things like the geospatial uh, 
r rules that the UN has been working on. But I think we might think about the roads in terms of the ecosystem. I think many of you are part of this infrastructure. But how can we make sure that these drivers and vehicles have a path to tread on which is taking us in the right direction? Um, I think the last thing that I want to say is the the recognition that until we not only move to subnational data, which is where it's meaningful to people, I, I often say that it's not when I moved to Washington, D.C., it wasn't important to me how the U.S. compared to Canada to the U.K. in terms of education. I wanted to know where to buy a house. I wanted to know what neighborhood to send my son to for school. That required highly granular zip code oriented data. That's not what large open data initiatives like the World Bank do. And that's not a criticism. It's just a recognition. We need to move towards local data, hyper-local data. It's not a coincidence that most app competitions that win, such as crime data in Washington, D.C., are about hyper-local data. You want to know what's the safest way to walk home, not only the easiest way to get from here to Europe. And that local data, hyper-local data, not only takes a different kind of openness, and an openness which is not just about large institutions like us, but also about governments, also about civil society organizations opening up. Open data is not just about open government data. But it also requires us to be useful and interact with the end user, which is the citizen, which is the beneficiary. And that's why we're doing all this in the first place. So I welcome that conversation, which I know will happen later on in the afternoon. And some of my colleagues, both from the bank and from others, can tell you what we're now trying to do, some of the things we're testing in Malawi and other countries where we've been able to now geocode 27 donors, what we're now doing in Kenya, where we have working with the government to geocode all public expenditure. But ultimately, that only matters if it's in a form that's useful and usable <coughs> by the citizen. Thank you very much.